Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Matiul Khan. I am consultant endocrinologist at Shifa International Hospital and assistant professor of endocrinology at Shifa College of Medicine. Today, the topic of discussion is hypothyroidism, diagnosis and management. Thyroid disorders, as we know, are the most common endocrine disorder observed after diabetes in endocrine practice. So uh, the regulation, if we go to the basics, we know that everything in endocrine starts from hypothalamus above the pituitary. So in the hypothalamus, the thyroid releasing hormone TRH is produced that will act on the pituitary, anterior pituitary, the TSH will be released from the anterior pituitary. And that acts on the TSH receptors, the TSH receptors on the thyroid gland to release T4 and T3 to the circulation. The T4 and uh, associated with it is the free T4, T3 and its free T4 will then go to the tissues and will then act on the tissue and do all the metabolic activity. So we know that T4 is then converted to the active form that is T3 and uh, it results in all the actions that it has. Now, there's a negative feedback mechanism from the free T4 and free T3. If there is increased free T4 or T3, there will be reduced TSH. And similarly, if the free T4 and T3 are low, there will be increased TSH. So this is the basic physiology uh, that we know. Now, what is hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism is a condition that results from inadequate production or action of thyroid hormone. So most commonly it results uh, from thyroid failure. Mostly we see the primary hypothyroidism, which is due to the thyroid gland uh, issues itself. Uh, it's very rare to see or less common to see secondary hypothyroid, which are because of the hypothalamus or pituitary, and they are called central hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism uh, may also be classified as either overt, in which there is frank decrease in the T4 levels and a compensatory increase in TSH, or they may also be subclinical, in which there is mild thyroid failure and the TSH is mildly elevated uh, around 4, 5, 6, or 7, and the T4 is in the normal range. Because the TSH is very sensitive marker, that's why it will start rising before the T4 goes down. So how common it is? It is very common condition and the prevalence of overt hypothyroidism is around 0.4%. And uh, of that of subclinical is even more, 10 or 15 times more. That is 4 to 8% of the population will have subclinical hypothyroidism. So we have to screen uh, many patients who have a lot of uh, vague symptoms, multiple symptoms, fatigue, lethargy, uh, weakness, generalized body aches and pains, weight gain, uh, skin and hair issues. So they should be screened for thyroid to know that the patient has hypothyroidism or not. So hypothyroidism is much more common in women and uh, the female to male ratio is 3 is to 1. And the diagnosis is in the mid-50s usually, but the, uh, it can be diagnosed even in the newborn, that is the congenital hypothyroidism. So there is another entity that is the postpartum hypothyroidism. It is usually a transient hypothyroid phase that will be there for a few months and then uh, it will be resolved in majority of the cases. Now, this is very common and it occurs in around 10 to 15 percent of women. So, what are the most common causes of hypothyroidism? The most common causes, obviously, it differs from region to region. In our region, uh, iodine deficiency is uh, still common, despite the fact that we have the iodine uh, in, uh, added in the salt, but still there are endemic areas of iodine deficiency and they have this iodine deficient goiter that will uh, initially be euthyroid, but then most of them or a lot of uh, those patients become hypothyroid. So iodine deficient goiter is still in Pakistan, but overall, all over the world, Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune form of thyroid destruction, that is the most common. And this is basically chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. Then we also have some uh, 
radioactive iodine induced hypothyroidism we know that we uh, treat the Gra graves disease in most cases with definitive treatment that is the radioactive iodine therapy that will then result in hypothyroidism and along with that we also have patients with post thyroidectomy hypothyroidism that's the surgical hypothyroidism so post thyroidectomy hypothyroidism radioactive iodine induced hypothyroidism iodine deficient goiter and Hashimoto's. These are the most common causes. So we can also see that the primary hypothyroid can either be due to destruction, that is due to Hashimoto's, neck external beam radiation, or RAI therapy. Or it can be due to drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and lithium midron uh, interferon. Or it may also be in the uh, defects in the biosynthesis, that is iodine deficiency. Now, other than that, we can also have the less common or the rare uh, central hypothyroidism, which is either due to pituitary or hypothalamic disease. And also, there may be transient hypothyroidism that is in the case of thyroiditis. Okay, so Hashimoto's chronic autoimmune thyroiditis uh, in the uh, US, it is the most common etiology of hypothyroidism. TPO antibodies, thyro thyroid uh, peroxidase antibodies is in 90% of the cases. And you can see because of the uh, because of the chronic inflammation and fibrosis, the patient may have uh, this pseudo-nodular uh, goiter appearance and uh, this may be confused with multinodular goiter. So uh, uh, there is increased incidence of Hashimoto's in Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, or other autoimmune disorders like celiac, adrenal insufficiency, type 1 diabetes, and so on. So what is thyroiditis? In thyroiditis, actually, uh, there happens to be uh, this uh, destruction of uh, the thyroid gland initially due to an inflammatory insult. It may be subacute thyroiditis due to post-viral, or it may also be due to the autoimmune chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. So initially, there, there will be this thyrotoxic phase in uh, which there will be hyperthyroid symptoms and then it will then result in hypothyroid phase. This hypothyroid phase may be for four, five, six months and eventually most of these patients become normal, euthyroid. Okay, so manifestations. Uh, usually hypothyroid, we know that the metabolism is slow. So the patient uh, has decreased metabolism and everything is slow. So cool, dry, coarse skin, non-pitting edema, puffy face and hands, and uh, the patient will have hoarseness of voice, bradycardia, and diastolic hypertension is also very important because of the fluid retention. Uh, the patient also has slow speech and poor memory, and uh, the thyroid may be enlarged, may not be enlarged. Now, this is the uh, hypothyroid facies. Here you can see the puffiness of face and the, um, the patient has uh, basically, uh, this is very uh, typical, but most of the patients do not have uh, all the features. So what is the more typical presentation that we see in the clinic? We may have just an incidental TSH elevation and the patient may be asymptomatic or may have some non-specific symptoms attributed to hypothyroidism and these lack sensitivity and specificity the patient may have fatigue cold intolerance weight gain mood changes hair or nail changes and constipation and uh, also irregular menses is uh, uh, something that we should also uh, always uh, go for checking or screening for tsh so on palpation again so thyroid may be enlarged may be normal may be small in hypothyroid but the consistency is usually firm. So we start with this case. A 30 years old female was evaluated for generalized weakness, paresthesias, aches and pains in different joints. So no arthritis on examination, no fever, extra articular manifestations of collagen vascular disease seen by rheumatologist and neurologist. Uh, blood sugars were normal in the CBC. Hemoglobin is 9.8 with the MCU of 1 of 4. Now with these body aches and pain, generalized weakness, fatigue, um, and anemia, uh, we should always think of screening for thyroid, hypothyroidism. 
Now, a calcium parameter with normal uh, RA factor is uh, just above the normal. Uh, it is 86, ESR is uh, 26. And there is mild hyperuricemia as well. So always think of thyroid when the patient has mild anemia, vague symptoms, multiple symptoms, body aches and pains, weight gain, carpal tunnel syndrome, neuropathies, mild hyperuricemia, or in the postpartum period. We should always think of thyroid. So it is often unsuspected and grossly underdiagnosed. Otherwise, thyroid is very common. So you should also suspect hypothyroidism in someone having menstrual issues, galactoria, premature ovarian uh, insufficiency, infertility, or uh, in the pubertal issues or height issues. In all these, we should do the screening test TSH. So especially in elderly women, men, pregnancy, postpartum, the family history of thyroid disease, recent changes in the symptoms or uh, someone with diabetes with other autoimmune disease or dyslipidemia or on drugs like amiodron or lithium. We should always check TSH. Now, the patient was seen by physician, additional information generated. So strong family history of hypothyroidism. So uh, she was postpartum, delivered six months back and is now breastfeeding. She's also taking iron and calcium uh, supplements. Uh, on examination, she has a small firm goiter. The TSH is remarkably high, more than 100, and free T4 is low. So this basically means the thyroid, there is thyroid failure. Free T4 is low, and in compensation, the TSH is increased. So the diagnosis is primarily hypothyroidism, and because of the clinical scenario, it is likely postpartum thyroiditis. Now, postpartum thyroiditis usually two to six months after delivery. Initially, there will be a transient thyrotoxicosis phase followed by hypothyroid. This transient thyrotoxicosis may not even be appreciated by the patient. So, and it is usually for a month or so. And uh, because it is painless, silent, so there is no pain over the neck. So, it's different from subacute thyroiditis in which the patient has pain over the neck. So 23% progress to permanent hypothyroidism. Other, uh, others will um, develop, you, uh, will become euthyroid after a few months or maybe a year. So it is more common with severe hypothyroidism or high antibody titer to have permanent hypothyroidism. So postpartum thyroiditis can have a very different clinical course. So uh, post-delivery, the patient may have this uh, transient thyrotoxic phase followed by hypothyroid phase. And then this will result in euthyroidism. This is most common. And then the patient may also have uh, this in uh, starting from the hypothyroidism. And uh, this may be uh, transient. And the patient may have permanent hypothyroidism as well. Now, there's one more thing that the patient may just develop transient thyrotoxicosis and then become euthyroid. It's also possible. And uh, one important thing is that you should always differentiate this postpartum thyroiditis from postpartum Graves' disease. In, in postpartum Graves' disease, there will be persistent thyrotoxicosis. And that, that will have high technetium uptake scan. So there will be increased uptake on the thyroid scan. Uh, on the other hand, the postpartum thyroiditis, the thyrotoxicosis due to postpartum thyroiditis will have decreased or reduced uptake on the scan. So we can basically uh, divide the types of hypothyroidism on based on the location of origin or based on the hormonal levels and symptoms. So based on the location of origin can be primary, which is most common caused by dysfunction of the thyroid gland, or it can be secondary with disorders involving the pituitary or tertiary disorder involving the hypothalamus. This secondary and tertiary both are called central hypothyroidism. Now, then we can also say that the patient either has overt hypothyroidism or subclinical. Overt has clinical manifestations as well. The T4 will be lower than the normal limit and the TSH will be markedly elevated. While in the subclinical, the T4 will be in the normal range, although a bit lower, but it will be in the normal range and the TSH may be up till 10. So uh, that is called subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, etiologies of primary hypothyroidism, uh, once we know that the TSH is high and the 3T4 or T4 is low, 
what are the causes of this primary hypothyroidism? The most common in our area is iodine deficiency, while in other part of the world, it is autoimmune Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This uh, patient may have a goiter or, or may also have autoimmune atrophic thyroiditis in which the patient will not have any goiter. So goiter has nothing to do with uh, the functionality. It is a structural issue. Whether the patient has goiter or nodule or multinodular goiter is different uh, from saying that the patient has hypothyroidism, euthyroidism, or hyperthyroidism. So hypo hypothyroidism during pregnancy is also very common. And then we also have some other causes like surgical remover, RAI therapy, or congenital hypothyroidism. There are drugs that uh, result in inhibition of thyroid hormone synthesis like amiodarone and, and lithium and antithyroid drugs as well. Secondary hypothyroid is due to any mass lesion uh, uh, that impinge on the pituitary stalk or it may be due to pituitary surgery or pituitary radiation. Tertiary is due to hypothalamic issues, any uh, tumor, trauma, irradiation, inflammation of that. And it can also be due to sarcoidosis or histiocytosis. So the major causes, the major, major causes are iodine deficiency, autoimmune Hashimoto's, pregnancy, postpartum induced, or maybe due to some treatment related or medication related. Uh, some words about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is the chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, the most common cause in uh, US, can be goitrous or non-goitrous. Anti-TPO antibody is positive in most of the cases. So if the patient is, has youth thyroid Hashimoto, that is if the antibodies is positive, but the T4 is normal, so there is no treatment. So you should not treat the goiter size with thyroxine or the antibody levels with thyroxine until unless the patient develops some subclinical hypothyroid or some symptoms, then we will go for it. So... Okay, so then uh, this is the spectrum. Initially, the patient will be youth thyroid with a free T4 or T4 normal and TSH is also normal. In the subclinical, free T4 is normal, but TSH is elevated mildly. In the overt, free T4 will be low and TSH elevated. Now, hypothyroidism and comorbid conditions, it is associated with other conditions like depression, autoimmune disorder, infertility, or metabolic disorders like hyperlipidemia or type 2 diabetes. So infertility and menstrual uh, disturbances are linked with hypothyroidism and we recommend that all infertile couples or uh, patients with menstrual issues should have at least screening of uh, hypothyroidism by just doing a TSH test. So long-term complications of untreated may be acute or chronic. So it may result in cardiovascular diseases. It may also have some pregnancy and fetal complication. That's why in pregnancy, we have a softer targets uh, uh, and uh, softer thresholds for starting the thyroxine that we will discuss later. And uh, the patient may also have some psychiatric and neurological complications, especially when in the developing age. And it may also in severe cases result in myxedema coma. So early diagnosis and treatment can prevent the long-term complications associated with untreated hypothyroidism. So what further testing is needed? Usually we don't need, but if we want to make the diagnosis, so anti-TPO antibody will be enough uh, for the patient diagnosis to call it primary hypothyroid, secondary to Hashimoto's or autoimmunity. We don't need NTTG in most cases. And ultrasound is not usually required, uh, so is FNA. So we have uh, certain indications for ultrasound when the patient has a nodule or multinodular goiter, but it has nothing to do with hypothyroidism. Any patient coming with hypothyroidism, the TSH is high and free T4 is low uh, and may have a diffuse goiter, so you, you don't need to order ultrasound in that patient. Yes, if the patient has a nodule or multinodular goiter, you may go for ultrasound just to confirm whether the patient has some uh, sinister cause of that nodule, but it has uh, it will not give any information regarding the hypothyroidism. And uh, uh, some people, uh, unfortunately, just order tests like uh, ultrasound, FNA, and all these, which are not required in hypothyroid. They have their own indications. And similarly, they do uh, this uh, thyroid uptake scan. Thyroid uptake scan is not at all required in hypothyroidism. 
This is only done in hyperfunctioning thyroid nodules. That is, in the thyrotoxicosis patients, we go for thyroid scan to know whether it's hot nodule or cold nodule, and then that cold nodule will then be evaluated by the ultrasound and FNA plus minus. So, algorithm just measure the TSH, normal TSH or elevated TSH. Next thing in elevated TSH will be free T4. Free T4 normal is subclinical. Free T4 low is primary hypothyroidism. Then you may go to TPO. The TPO positive will be Hashimoto's primary hypothyroidism. TPO negative will be other causes. But both of these primary hypothyroid needs treatment with thyroxine. So then going back to this uh, elevated TSH, free T4 normal is subclinical. Subclinical who are TPO positive, especially when they have some symptoms or when uh, they are actually planning for pregnancy or have some inf infertility or menstrual issues, we go for thyroxine replacement, but that will be 50% of the total dose that we will discuss. Now, if the TSH is normal, usually you don't need uh, to go further until unless you are considering some central uh, cause, that is the pituitary. So if you are not considering that, no test is required. But if you are considering that, you go for free T4. If it is also low, now a low free T4 with a normal TSH and uh, uh, making sure that the there is no lab error, then it is usually uh, either due to pituitary or sick thyroid or drug effects. But if the free T4 is also normal and TSH is also normal, you don't need to do further tests. So what further to look before starting? treatment. Now, we first have to know what is the diagnosis? Is it primary or secondary? And what is the cause of that? And also the coexistent conditions. Age of the patient is important. If the patient is elderly and has some comorbid, we should know that because starting the therapy with the low dose will be more wise. And uh, severity of the hypothyroidism in terms of the TSH, whether the patient has subclinical or overt and very high TSH, will require full dose of thyroxine. And also co uh, coexistent drugs and coexistent medical conditions, any cardiac disease or osteoporosis. So we should be knowing that. Now, levothyroxine a replacement therapy, many causes have one treatment. And the, the main three goals are resolution of patient symptoms and signs, to achieve normalization of TSH, and to avoid iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis, that is the over-treatment. So these are the three goals. And the treatment is with levothyroxine, which is the drug of choice. So we generally uh, normalize first the TSH and usually it is recommended to be less than 2.5. But we avoid iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis as well. And the brand name should be uh, kept same in that particular patient. We should not keep on changing the brand names because then there will be some 10 to 20% difference in bioavailability of all. So we won't be knowing uh, how much to increase the dose. Full replacement dose is usually 1.6 mcg per kg per day. And it is given one hour before breakfast, that is on fa in a fasting state, empty stomach. So, uh, and in some patient, we don't uh, need to start with the full replacement dose. That is in some patient, not in all patients. So it's not never wrong to start low and titrate up. So, especially we should be careful in um, coronary artery disease patients, elderly, in which we will start with 25 to 50 mcg. And then every one month to two months, we will increase by 25, 25 mcg per day. So, this is how we go. So, we start with thyroxine and then uh, recheck after six to eight weeks and increase the dose until the TSH normalizes. So, Generally, after starting, we call the patient back in six weeks with the TSH. This TSH alone is usually required for monitoring until you suspect some compliance issues in which we will do the free T4 as well. So then we titrate by 25 to 50 mcg per day, per day increments. For example, a patient has on uh, started on 100 mcg. So when we are increasing the dose, we should not increase to 200. We should just increase to 125. So this is how we go around and the target is 2.5 TSH. Once it is uh, stable, we can check the TSH later on after three months and then after six, six months interval. 
Now, changes with treatment, the patient starts uh, feeling better within two weeks and the full symptom relief may take three to six months after TSH levels. And in some patient, even the TSH have normalized, still they have other symptoms. That's very important. At that point of time, we should screen for OSA or depression and any other uh, concomitant issues. Or uh, there is also one complex thing, which is basically uh, in those 5 to 10% of the patient, the T4 is not converted to T3. And uh, there is a, a suggestion to uh, add T3 in those patients as well. Now, this is a bit controversial topic, so I'm not going to the detail of that. And uh, it's not yet in the recommendations. So I'll just stick on the T4 replacement. And we also should know the complications that is the risk of overtreatment, atrial fibrillation and osteoporosis. So if uh, someone asks a question, what are the thyroid hormone preparations other than levothyroxine? So then we should know the T3 cytomel. It's not available in Pakistan. And they, then we can also have uh, some uh, T3 and T4 mixtures, thyrolair and uh, desiccated thyroid hormone, which is the armored thyroid. So all these are available in West, but it's not available in Pakistan. And uh, still the guidelines do recommend levothyroxine only. So in our patient, we started with 100 mcg of thyroxine in empty stomach, called the patient back after six weeks, the TSH was 63. Patient reports good compliance. Dose was increased to 125, called after three months. Again, the TSH is 38. So this patient does, is not responding uh, what we are desiring that the TSH in three uh, or four months should now be normalized. What is the issue in that? So it's very common to see such patients. What are the causes of high dose requirements? Number one, number two, how long to continue? Is thyroxine safe in, uh, during breastfeeding? These are three uh, further questions. So what is the uh, cause of increased levothyroxine dose? Number one, drugs that interfere with absorption like calcium, iron, PPI questionable. So these should be uh, asked from the patient. And then you can space apart. For example, if the patient is also requiring iron and calcium, that can be given in the evening. And uh, thyroxine will be given before breakfast. Along with that, some drugs interfere with hepatic metabolism. Uh, and these are rifampin, phenobarbital, uh, carbamazepine, sertraline, probably other SSRIs as well. And these are very commonly prescribed drugs. Causes of increased levothyroxine uh, dose. So what else? So blocks the conversion of T4 to T3 and mudron. Then we should also think of malabsorption and compliance issues and estrogen and compliance is really very common. So we should always make sure that the patient is taking uh, the drug at the particular time. That is one hour before breakfast at least on an empty stomach. So what to do? So space out the tablets of this patient uh, from the other offending drugs like calcium and uh, iron and uh, should be taking empty stomach. And uh, then... Uh, this patient, after spacing out the iron and calcium tablet, was re-evaluated and TSH reduced to 2.8. Now, interestingly, the patient was continued on the same dose and asked to come back after three months, but the TSH was less than 0 0.01. What is the possibility? One possibility may be that uh, it is overdose for this patient now. So in that case, we decreased the dose, but still the patient had less than 0 0.01. So what happened was actually a reversibility of primary hypothyroidism, especially this case was a postpartum. And we know that in the postpartum uh, hypothyroidism, most cases are reversible. In 70-80% uh, of the patient, the patient will become euthyroid and you are giving thyroxine that will result in thyrotoxicosis. And uh, then we also should be knowing that uh, subacute thyroiditis infections also result in reversible hypothyroidism. And some drugs like lithium interferon also result in reversible hypothyroidism. And another note is that 20% of the autoimmune hypothyroid, which was considered to be a permanent hypothyroidism, but 20% of them are, are reversible. There are case reports of them as well. So secondary central hypothyroidism is due to... Uh, this is caused by decreased thyroidal secretion of hormone caused by 
insufficient stimulation of the thyroid gland by the TSH. So TSH come ho raha hai, pituitary release, which is secondary, or TRH release, which is the tertiary hypothyroidism, both combined are central hypothyroidism. So there will be characteristically low T4 with, with inappropriately normal TSH, or it may not be elevated that much. It may be a free T4 very much low, but the TSH of 5, so that should also be uh, in that case should also be considered for central hypothyroidism. And especially we should be asking about the history of steroids uh, and also of pituitary surgery or pituitary adenoma questions from the patient. So, so now we will suspect such secondary cases in uh, someone with uh, known hypothalamic or pituitary disease, a mass lesion in the pituitary or symptoms of hypothyroid with other pituitary deficiencies. So this is characterized by low T4 and TSH not appropriately elevated. Now, when we are replacing, we should not be then monitoring TSH. We should be monitoring, remember, free T4 in those patients. So treatment, TSH is not useful to monitor um, LT4 therapy, thyroxine therapy. TSH is suppressed to less than normal with small doses of LT4. That's why it will give a false uh, impression of over-replacement. That's why in those patients, we should be just uh, doing the free T4. We should keep the free T4 in the central uh, portion of the reference range. And remember, it is pituitary, so rule out the adrenal insufficiency first. Now, a few words about subclinical hypothyroidism, which is defined as elevated TSH level with normal levels of free T4 affects up to 10% of adult population and most often caused by autoimmune Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So there is greater risk of progression from subclinical to overt uh, whenever the patient has TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies positivity. So when do you need to treat? Uh, this is the age cutoff 60 or 65. So less than 60 or 65 patients and then we will uh, see the cutoffs for TSH. But first, let's talk about more than 60 age. Remember, in more than 60 age, a 6 TSH will be normal for the, that age population. So you don't need to uh, treat them. But if it is more than 7, uh, you may consider treatment, especially if the patient has some symptoms. And especially if it is more than 10, you treat all of them. But if the age is less than 60 and does not have any um, uh, coronary artery disease or atrial fibrillation, then we should measure TPO and uh, follow the TSH if it is 4.5 to 6 or 6.9. But in a symptomatic patient who is plan or the patient who is uh, planning for pregnancy or has a positive TPO and has a goiter and hypothyroid symptoms, in those patients, it should be treated. If it is 7 to 9.9, .9, we treat most of these patients who are less than 60 years of age. Another approach, maybe you can repeat and see the trends. That's also perfectly all right. Hypothyroid symptoms and normal TFT. Now, this is another thing. Many patients, especially in the internet era, have this uh, Wilson syndrome. It's not Wilson disease, it's Wilson syndrome. It refers to the presence of common and non-specific symptoms relatively low body temperature, normal levels of thyroid hormones. The patient should not be treated with thyroxine when uh, there is no lab diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So then the extreme uh, decompensated state of untreated uh, severe hypothyroidism is mixed edema coma. The prognosis is poor with reported mortality of 20 to 50%, the triad of hypothermia, hyponatremia, hypercapnia. And uh, there is some precipitating event like cold exposure, infection, trauma, anesthesia. Most patients have low free T4 and high TSH. But how much the TSH is high does not dictate whether the patient may have clinical uh, mixed edema coma or not. This is a clinical diagnosis. A patient may have a TSH of 40 and can have mixed edema coma. On the other hand, the patient may have more than 100 and may be perfectly uh, sitting in the clinic. So TSH cannot tell this, uh, cannot diagnose the mixed edema coma. It is a clinical diagnosis. The patient have hypothyroidism, so treat with large IV doses of thyroxine. And even a T3 is added if there is no response. Hypocortisolemia, so we start IV, hydrocortisone, and then give a 
100 mg q6 hourly initially and then 50 mg uh, q6 hourly followed by q8 hourly hypoventilation we don't delay the intubation and mechanical ventilation then hypothermia with blankets no active rewarming hyponatremia mild fluid restriction is required hypotension cautious volume expansion because it may result in uh, fluid retention and uh, pulmonary edema so hypoglycemia glucose administration precipitant should be then eliminated for example if infection then liberal use of antibiotics Mixedema coma therapeutic endpoint is involved uh, improved mental status improved cardiac pulmonary function so now uh, this is another common entity thyroid function in non thyroidal illness thyroid should not be assessed in seriously ill patients unless strong suspicion of thyroid dysfunction so and possibility of adrenal insufficiency must be considered and ruled out since treatment of hypothyroidism may accelerate cortisol metabolism so in critically ill patient so there will be low free t4 and uh, t3 uh, who do not have to have an underlying uh, primary thyroid disorder so do not treat with thyroid hormone and repeat the test in 1 to 2 weeks after the acute illness ata guidelines about thyroid hypothyroid in pregnancy so basically uh, this will be covered in another lecture uh, which is the thyroid in pregnancy uh, but just remember few things when the patient is on uh, levothyroxine we always should increase the dose and uh, it should be increased by 20 to 30 percent and uh, if the patient is not on thyroxine and the patient uh, becomes preg uh, plans for pregnancy we should tell them the tsh should be at least less than 2.5 and uh, when to start treatment for a subclinical again 2.5 to uh, to the upper limit of normal and nttpo positive should be treated with levothyroxine so this will be discussed in detail so the take home message is suspect hypothyroidism thyroxine is the treatment for primary hypothyroid dose changes in thyroxine according to tsh levels some causes of primary hypothyroidism are reversible treat patients only with abnormal thyroid function thank you so much